Hi, I'm Corinne Spinks Chester and welcome to the Cannabis Forum. This six week series is designed to inform, educate, and connect the Missouri cannabis community with the members of our new emerging industry. If you're looking for information about how to get a job in the new market, we can help. If you're a patient and you're looking for information about the best way to medicate for your condition, we've got answers to those questions too. So stay tuned for lots of info from the Cannabis Industry Forum. Hey everybody and welcome to tonight's Missouri Cannabis Patients Forum. I'm Corinne Spinks Chester. Thank you so, so much for joining us. I am super, super happy to be here tonight and talking about this topic. Um, happy Thursday. Let's see what we have here. So this event is the third in a six event series designed to create collaborative conversations about important topics in the Missouri cannabis community. There's a lot, lot, lot going on, but first I want to give a big shout out and thank you to our sponsors, uh, American Cannabis Business Network, Greenway Magazine, Blue Key CBD. Thank you so much for your support. So community news, we can finally, finally say that dispensaries in Missouri are opening. However, we cannot say that dispensaries have medical marijuana for sale. That is not happening yet. Um, that still looks like it's going to be a few weeks out. No labs have received commencement yet. And so, as we all know, that cannabis cannot be sold unless it's been lab tested. So what we sort of anticipate there is that first harvests are going to be coming in. As soon as the lab is up and commenced, they're going to have a lot of work to do. But one of the interesting things to see will be how much of that flower is just sent to dispensaries for patients and how much is diverted to manufacturing to start production on edibles, vape carts, things like that. So um, that's going to be a really interesting thing. Um, I think that's going to create a little bit of a limit in the market to begin with. So we'll see. I'll be really excited to see more of these cultivations come online. Three are currently growing and rumor has it that somebody's in the midst of their first harvest potentially. So that would be exciting. I shall name no names. And so let's see what else. Oh, let's see. In Bliss is currently carrying CBD and offering education. And our program stat updates are courtesy of Greenway Magazine. We now have 60,000 60,000 patients in Missouri. That is so, so exciting. I remember during the campaign when we were out talking to people and we started um, trying to, you know, we had to get predictions of patient counts and all that. And we started talking about having between 100 and 300,000 patients by the end of year three. And we are on track for that. I mean, we are seriously on track for that. We're just a little over a year out and we've got 60,000. And listen to this, almost 18,000 patients are cultivating cannabis at home. That is incredible to me. That's, that's crazy. That's a crazy percentage of the patients. And some of those numbers are caregivers and they're growing for multiple people. So um, Missouri really showed up on this one. I tell you, that's pretty exciting. So now that we have all these tens of thousands of Missourians finding cannabis to be something that helps them, um, like myself, um, one of the things that comes up a lot in conversations I'm having with people is how do I talk to my doctor about being a medical cannabis card holder? I have this card. I didn't get it from my primary care doctor, that's for sure. And what do I do now? So I have invited three people, three ladies who are working in the Missouri space and they are all working to educate patients. And this is an issue that's really, really close to me and to, I've really experienced this a lot in my family and all three of these ladies are working to educate people in the community. They're working directly with patients. And so I've asked each one of them to just take a few minutes to introduce themselves and to tell us a little bit about their work, the companies that they're working with, and to tell us a little bit about what they're doing in the community. And I'd love to start with you, Marcella. 
Yes. So I'm Marcella Povis. I own Natural Journey, where my mission is to empower and educate the community on using plant-based and nature-based alternatives to healing on their journey to health and happiness. Um, in the medical cannabis space, I actually have a doctor and him and I work closely together to get people um, certified and to get them um, their next, the next step in getting access um, to their medicine. And I also am certified in dosing administration um, and methodologies in medical cannabis under Dr. Dustin Sulak. And um, I also provide uh, services to my clients, my customers, my patients. Um, and we are just excited to help people get in touch um, with the medicine um, and have them try it at the very least uh, so they can see for themselves. Um, and you're here in the St. Louis area. I'm in St. Louis, absolutely. I'm in the St. Louis area. Mm -hmm. And our, our processes are now all, on, all online. Um, so you can really be anywhere you're most comfortable um, to either get something from the store, get your certification, and or meet with me um, so that we can discuss uh, what's best for you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Dawn, you're also in the St. Louis area. Tell us, Dawn, the Cannabis Advocate. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing here in the St. Louis area. So I have been born and raised here in St. Louis as well. Um, I am Floyd Bird Academy's uh, virtual cannabis clinic co-owner. So I pretty much oversee things of helping our patients get certified, um, speak to the physicians about their past, uh, getting their medical records from previous doctors, gathering them as they're now a part of our clinic and mm -hmm. our patient. That coordinated care is important when it comes to issues of physician conversations and correspondence. So I have a, a diverse background in medical records, HIM, uh, billing and coding. I'm a medical assistant. Uh, so I've worked with doctors hand in hand to be able to translate what patients need to say to the doctor and what doctors need to say to the patient. Um, it's my duty um, because every person I work with could have been a loved one because um, I lost my mom breast cancer 17 years ago, and I realized this is a place that needs to be helped. So uh, I do that with everyone. I have uh, private clients, like contract clients, mm -hmm. where at a drop of a dime, she's going to the ER and I'm going. Um, but in general, with Flow Academy's virtual cannabis clinic, I help you with the full process. Your application, seeing the offer online, as uh, Marcella does also, virtual is really, really actually more comfortable for patients. And I think it's a better setting of comfort to get rid of some of the white coat ID, talking to a doc. So just kind of helping patients learn how to really translate how to handle and navigate their health care. That's fantastic. And you're also, so you're, you work with certifications on a daily basis. How many certifications has Fleur Burt done? Do you know? I didn't pull the census up like I was supposed to before I jumped on here. Um, I've worked <laughs> I'm just with curious. I'm just curious. Uh, since the beginning of program, June 29th of 19, because um, I've worked at a couple of different clinics. So I personally have touched, talked, worked with thousands of patients. That's right. Um, is a fairly new clinic because I decided to step out of recently during our pandemic of all times to say, no, I'm yeah. going to do what I know I need to do for the people that I specifically want to work with hand in hand. So it's been awesome, scary, but very fulfilling. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. April, you're in Kansas City. I am. So tell us a little bit about what's going on in KC. And Cannabis Care Team is a new entity to me. So I know nothing very much about, except for just the conversations we've had here in the last week. So I'm excited to hear more about what you're doing there. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. And it's really an honor to be a part of this group. I mean, you're all making such a huge difference um, in the lives of patients. So thank you. Um, 
So cannabis care team was really something that I started actually with my mom because, you know, we had experienced a lot of benefits with medical cannabis. Um, five years ago, my son suffered a traumatic brain injury and we were really um, out of options and cannabis was the only thing that worked for him and continues to work for him today. You know, I had a lot of family members who were starting to see success with it. And you know, being a nurse, a registered nurse for 15 years, I had been um, taught that, you know, cannabis wasn't really medicine, that people were just using it to get high. And, you know, when I was doing all the research regarding my son and dosing and, you know, just the medical benefits, I really became aware of how miraculous that plant, this plant can be. And I want to, I really want to um, spread that information. So our, our mission is really to provide the education, advocacy, and support that patients need to experience the medical benefits of cannabis and to consume it safely. Um, we really want to educate the, the public, patients, the industry, and health, other healthcare providers as well. So that's really what we do. I do a lot of individual patient consultants. I help patients get certified. Um, and, you know, I, I love that we have all of these capabilities um, due to Zoom and all of that. So, you know, I'm able to connect with people all across the country and really just provide education. That's what, that's what we're all about because it's a very overwhelming process. I went through that and, you know, some people just need a little bit more handholding and that's what we're here for. I think that's amazing. And you bring up when you were talking about the stigma, I was thinking about this is your brain on drugs. And that's actually one of the problems with dealing with doctors is because a lot of them have that same education that I did, you know, dare, this is your brain on drugs, um, and that whole bit. And so I was thinking about that when you were talking. And, um, you know, I don't know, this is like I said before, this is a subject that's really, you know, it's a thing for me because I'm a patient. I came into um, I came into cannabis not even realizing how much it could help me. And so um, I have rheumatoid arthritis and I was it's a genetic form. And so I was diagnosed very early. And so by the time I was 35, they already had me on really harsh, harsh medications and all that. And so I was smoking pot to deal with the side effects of the medication. I mean, it wasn't stopping my hair from falling out, but I could manage a trip to the grocery store without throwing up in the parking lot most days. So, you know, I mean, that was legit. That was it, you know? And, and so when I started finding out, when I started working on the campaign in 2016 and Ashley Markham, um, from Aiden's Alliance, I'm good friends with, tag messaged me on Facebook and said, a one-to-one -one could put you in remission. So I started doing research and I go to talk to my rheumatologist about it. And she says, aren't you worried about getting addicted? And I just looked at her and I was like, I mean, you gave me tramadol. I'm not any more worried about being addicted to cannabis than I am to tramadol. And I go, and the cannabis can't kill me. And she just looked at me like, and I said, so, and I had a little bit of knowledge about the endocannabinoid system at that point, just enough to be dangerous, you know, but what I said to her, I talked to a friend of mine who was a lab tech, and we were talking about the fact that doctors aren't educated on the endocannabinoid system. They don't even know that it exists, but what they are educated on is the G protein system, and that's one of the big parts of the endocannabinoid system, and so I said that to her. I said, you don't know what the endocannabinoid system is, but you know what the G protein system is. And I challenge you to do some research and find out the rest. And she did, you know, she did. Um, the problem is she works for a healthcare chain. She worked for, you know, BJC or SMS or one of these other groups. So as we move through and talk with patients, that's something that I'm hearing a whole lot of is my primary care doctor won't talk to me about that. So um, April, have you had some experience with this and this dealing with some of these healthcare systems and having to, because some of them, are not, they're not even allowed to talk to you about it. Like you bring up cannabis and they will shut you down. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so funny story. The first day that you could submit your application, I intentionally scheduled an appointment with my primary on that day because I want, I thought he would sign it. Honestly, we had a really open, honest um, relationship. He knew I consumed cannabis. Um, so I was just expecting to go in there and get that piece of paper signed. Well, he couldn't. And he, he wanted to, and he supported what I did. Um, because he knew that I was able to take less of other medications for chronic migraines. Um, he just said, my lawyers, they won't let me sign in. So that was my first experience with that. And I hear that over and over again with patients. Um, you know, they, it, they have these wonderful relationships with these primary care doctors and they, they talk to them about everything, but they just can't talk to them about cannabis. And yeah. it's very, very hard. And it, um, you know, a lot of times patients have to do some homework beforehand um, to really make sure that that conversation goes the way that they want it to. So, no, go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, there's definitely some tips I'm sure that we've all shared with patients on how to, on how to help that. But, um, you know, it's just very frustrating for people when they have seen that something can work for them, but their primary care doctor doesn't agree. And so you bring up an important point. You're not going to get your certification from your primary care doctor. That's where clinics like Florvert come in. There have been some amazing clinics that, and also just so I can say this to acknowledge this in front of all the people who are watching, Dawn, thank you so much for what you did to help the people who were defrauded by weed certs. I know you guys gave away some free certifications and all that. I know some of the other groups have been involved in that. Lot, too. Right. I know so, Dr. Ward yeah. took a lot. Um, we just tried to do the part they came to us, needed to help, and treated them and told them, now you're our patient. This is how we are going to make sure, you know, you're ready to do those things. You need to reach out for that. This is legitimately a doctor that is a part of your care team. A lot of folks don't know um, that that exists for them. They just don't. So I like telling them, hey, no, if you go on to this specialist, that specialist, or primary, that's a care team. Somebody's supposed to coordinate that for you. You should know these things. I find that there's a lapse of just those uh, homespun educational things that your mom passed down or a sickly loved one passed down. For me, my mom was sickly endometriosis by like 14. So she was at the ER every month getting shots. Um, she learned how to carry and advocate for herself as a Black woman going to Homer Phillips um, in the 50s and 60s. Which is a totally I different mean, story than somebody who was like me advocating so, um, for healthcare. She taught yeah. me by default how to present myself at a doctor's appointment. How do you talk to your doctor? I was always honest with doctors when I realized they wouldn't my parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, I smoke weed. Yeah, I do. This helps me for my migraines. And I was able to speak comfortably to them. So when I found doctors that were auditional, the way I was raised to be able to rebut audition and still argue my point respectfully. Mm -hmm. I still respectfully that this plan helps me back. So I'll be doing that. You can prescribe drugs, but I won't take them. So I think my rheumatologist was really super impressed when I had to stop seeing her because I wasn't on all the medication anymore. And yeah, I mean, they, they had me on methotrexate, which is like low dose chemotherapy. And I went in and I had been in remission for a short period of time. And I was like, you know, she says, well, we should just put you back on the methotrexate preventatively. I'm like, you want me to poison myself preventatively? Are you kidding me? And so it's been, I just bring this up because it's kind of a mixed bag. You know, you have one doctor who, who will embrace cannabis and, and, you know, what it can do for you. Uh, that was a physician's assistant that worked for my rheumatologist. So it was a different, I had like four providers when I went into that office at any given time, you know, but the thing that killed me about her was that her brother worked in the industry in Colorado and she just still thought it was all about people wanting to get high. And so um, when I went in, when I started on the cannabis therapy that I do now, uh, I was like four years ago, three and a half years ago, 46 pills a day. 
and I still take one medication that's a pharmaceutical. I take one pill twice a day and that's it. I mean, everything else is plant medicine or supplements or, or cannabis. I use edibles on a daily basis to manage inflammation and autoimmune and all that. And so I'm curious about the go between between all of these doctors and Marcella, I know you've done some work with patients who are older ladies like my I'm 50. So my age and older, and you're doing a lot of work with that age group. And we've had some conversations about that. But and I know because I've gone to doctor's appointments with my mom, my mom's an amputee. She has fibromyalgia and chronic pain, and she's on a slew of medications. If she tests positive for cannabis when she goes to her pain management doctor, he will cut her off. No questions asked. You are done. You cannot. Now, that puts her in a bad position because she might have withdrawals from not having it. And I find it hysterically horrific that he will write her a prescription that requires they also give her Narcan to keep in her refrigerator in case the drugs kill her. But he won't talk to her about cannabis. So how do you deal with that with patients? Because that just, that boggles my mind. It really, it's really, um, I mean, for a lack of a better word, it's disgusting. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's and it's really sad. Uh, so at this point, in life, I think even in this last year, everyone needs to realize that you are in control. You have the power. So be empowered yourself to hire or fire that doctor. I mean, if they're not going to talk to you or if they are not even willing to, to open up, I mean, if you have to keep that doctor, okay. But like you said, you may need four, five, six doctors on your care team to, you know, go to the doctor who's going to be open with you and talk to you about it. Um, and that's really important that you have somebody that you can go to and talk to about it. Because if one doctor won't, someone else will, if you need to fire them, fire them. If you can't, then that's when you find somebody else who will have the conversation with you. So, and I think that's a good point because I think a lot of times people are really intimidated by doctors and I mean, they're, you know, in all respect, like doctors are amazing. They go to school for years and they have to be, you have to be incredibly intelligent just to even survive medical school, the dedication and all that that's required. So I don't mean any disrespect. This is really a failure in education um, to me. It's, you know, a direct result of prohibition. So we're dealing with doctors who don't know what they don't know, you know, and so that, that makes it a little bit more complicated. And so I know, I know cannabis friendly doctors. I know Dr. Mimi Bo in St. Louis. I know Dr. Lisa Roark down in uh, Southern Missouri. I know that there are cannabis friendly doctors in Missouri. And I just wonder is there like some kind of, like, is there a list somewhere? Is there like, we need to like, April's nodding her head, okay? Because this needs to be, if it's not a thing, it needs to be a thing. Tell me about that, April. Right, okay, well, it's not a, um, con it's, I mean, basically the start of a list. So the um, Society of Cannabis Clinicians is a, a group of professionals, doctors, nurses, um, all healthcare professionals who are licensed. If you're a member of that organization, uh, it means you value um, cannabis education and that cannabis uh, professional relationship with, with others. Um, mm -hmm. If you do go to their website, you can actually search and you can find um, physicians. Um, now, Missouri needs about 60,000 more, um, but there, yeah. you know, there are some there and, you know, that is a, a good resource for people. What's that website? That. Tell us that website again. Um, it's the Society for Cannabis Clinicians.org. Okay. And I'll post that in the comments under the video later on. Um, but let me, yeah, I'll make a note of that and I'll make sure I post that with the video. That's a really good idea. Yeah. And I think we need to start a list for Missouri physicians here 
and find a way to get that out there. Maybe if we can put it together, maybe we can just all share it and just kind of take responsibility for putting that together. I think it will be really meaningful to try to help connect some of these doctors. I mean, I don't know if people really understand the risk that doctors take when they choose to work with patients that are using cannabis. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute because it's really an issue of insurance more than it is anything. Um, malpractice insurance is really difficult to get. And even though using cannabis means you have a lower need for things like opiates, it means doctors' malpractice insurance goes through the roof. If they're writing certifications and doing um, health care, it's a whole thing. And so that's one of the reasons why it's harder to find doctors who really want to deal with cannabis. And one thing that I've actually, I've had three patients ask me for this, and this is something that I'm actively looking for in Missouri, and that is a doctor who is a pain management doctor who's brave enough to explore using cannabis to help their patients come off of opioids. Because um, one of the one of the great privileges that I've had working in in advocacy is meeting some of these doctors that are doing amazing amazing research. Dr. Sue Sicily, Dr. Addie Wilson Poe, who worked at Wash U for a while, did an amazing study on uh, the way that cannabis and opioids interact with each other, and they found that the efficacy of opioids is double almost what it is when you add cannabis. So that means that I don't need to take a great big oxy to get the same amount of relief. I can take a fraction of that if I have, but there's some, there's some serious science and research that still needs to be done for that. And I know a lot of doctors are super hesitant. Like I said, my mom's doctor, he won't even have, you know, he won't even have that conversation with her. Um, so if you guys know of doctors in Missouri that are willing to take those kinds of risks, I would love to hear about that because that is going to be a huge challenge. But the fact of the matter is, if we can find doctors who are willing to do that, then a lot, a lot of people can get off medication that will kill them. I mean, I opened the fridge at my mom's house one day and there's Narcan in the door. And I was just, I mean, like it, it killed me, you know? The idea, I mean, she's in a wheelchair. If she overdosed in the other room, she's not making it to the kitchen to get that. You know what I mean? But she doesn't want a pop brownie because, you know, so it kind of kills me. So have you guys heard of any doctors that are doing that kind of work? April, you kind of nod in your head, and I feel like you maybe know something here. <laughs> um, I don't specifically know of any pain management physicians um, in Missouri. I work with patients in Oklahoma, and the pain management doctors are starting to come around there. Um, my recommendation of someone needs to find a pain management doctor is to um, do what Marcella said. And, you know, if you need to leave that doctor and find a new one, uh, I've had patients, who, you know, I might give them a list of doctor's names and I say, okay, when you call, you're going to talk to the person, you're going to ask them how the doctor feels about cannabis. That's going to be one of your first questions, because based on their response, that's going to let you know if they're even willing to discuss it. That's, so that would be the first thing. Um, but Karen, you know, the CDC did provide some guidelines for pain management physicians. And one of those guidelines was they need to stop testing for THC uh, because there's no reason why a positive UA um, should restrict a patient's, um, you know, prescription medications. So I actually tell my patients, print this off, you know, print off this research, take it into your doctor's office with you if that's what yeah. And I asked you to email it to me and I'm going to email it to my mom's doctor and tell him to chew on that for a minute because that's CDC stuff and they might not listen to me because I'm just a patient. And, you know, when we come in there and they go, oh, you Googled that, didn't you? How cute, you know? And it's like, I mean, I'm an intelligent human being. Like, I got a life. <laughs> I got stuff going on. I'm not an idiot. Come on, you know? But it's just, I don't know, and it's a very frustrating thing for me. And so 
I, I'm starting, I was thinking about as we were kind of chatting a minute ago about how all of this stuff works with HIPAA and going back and forth between a doctor who wrote a certification and a pain management doctor or a primary care doctor, a specialist. Are those doctors even talking to each other? Is that happening, Dawn? I mean, as you as you move working right. with patients in the certification, what have you seen? Honestly, that comes with um, the, the compliance of the patient. Um, mm -hmm. As with any clinic, anybody that's within a clinic, the compliance of a patient is what's going to be the, the fruition of it. So um, in the past, yes, I've had medical records requests um, that have come for me that I've requested with no problem. It's really just telling the patient their reasonable expectations. A patient owns their record. They just don't know that they can't house it, that they can't house their record. But if you can instruct them on specific pieces you need out of it, most of them have an online access to my chart, mm -hmm. patient portals. That is your whole chart right there. So they, they don't know these terms. Um, asking for a history and physical, asking for labs, because you'll see what they said about you and you didn't realize they said it about you. It can be a lot of fun reading your chart when your doctor doesn't know that you know what that stuff means. That can be fantastic. Um, I, I've really enjoyed the last few years having better access to my medical records and having that all online. And I think, you know, now even with the pandemic, I mean, you know, our legislature already tried to ban telehealth certifications. Um, that they fail, thank goodness. Mo can trade, and uh, they sent some information to Jeff City about telehealth visits and how that would affect patients and all that, and they backed off on that. But I think when the pandemic hit, I think the idea that telehealth would go away just kind of like that's that's a that's a ridiculous thing. But I just you know I think patients will skip talking to their doctor about it sometimes because it's just complicated, and I think that that can be a mistake. And Marcella and I've had several conversations about why, why is it important that I talk to my doctor about that I'm using cannabis? I didn't even realize for a long time that cannabis interacts with like a whole lot of stuff. Now that doesn't mean negatively. It doesn't mean that it is harmful in any way, form or fashion, but talk a little bit about that, Marcella, and about, when you talk to your doctor about how this affects your other medications and all that. Honestly, um, there are sites that are open, I mean, for anyone to go to, to see uh, what interactions there are with cannabis, if any, uh, for any medications that um, any one person is taking now or currently. And um, I mean, really in having a conversation with your doctor about those interactions, sure. arm yourself with, with, um, printouts with whatever materials you can, because really education is going to break down the barriers. Uh, just as the doctor was educated on, you know, what they know, you have been educated based on your experience, based on using, or maybe it's something that, you know, a person just wants to try because they heard you, this could potentially work for me. So you may have to do a little legwork, um, but you can go into your doctor's office like confident and with information to say, hey, these other people are experiencing this, you know, they're taking these same medications or whatever the case may be just to, to even open the door, open the possibility of then allowing your doctor to say, oh, let me, let me go back and consider this and let me, you know, chew on it for a little bit uh, based on what you're, what you're asking of me and what you're telling me. Um, and that way you do also have a conversation then with your doctor. It's not always your doctor just telling you what you need to do um, to be you. Uh, to be help you. Do you think that there are certain kinds of medications that people take that they need to be really mindful of talking to their doctor about cannabis interaction with? I don't, I can't, I don't know of any off the top of my head. So I'm asking a question I don't, I don't actually know the answer to, but there like are pressure some. medication or anything like that. Right. So really, um, as I've learned, it's anything utilizing um, a liver enzyme 
um, similar to pharmaceutical medications. They're usually blood thinners. Uh, okay. So anytime, uh, really, if the doctor's telling you, or if it says in your prescription bottle, don't eat grapefruit with this, um, with this medication, they utilize that same liver enzyme. Um, but science, uh, studies are coming out um, more and more as they're being done to prove those interactions. And again, um, there's websites that, that are out there available that will tell you if there has been or is an interaction at all. That's interesting because I've actually taken medications before that where you couldn't do grapefruit or anything like that. And those are, that's not just like one kind of medication. There's anxiety medications and antidepressants, and there's also right. some heart medications and stuff like that that say don't. So that's like, a, that's a pretty broad thing. That's not even just like pain medication or one thing. It's That's like a huge broad thing when you start talking about about enzymes. And I think that, you know, I don't know, I mean, it just, it gets to be such a complex topic when you start talking about how all these things interact. And a lot of people who don't even use THC at all use CBD and CBD can change the way that your body metabolizes other um, medications. If I take CBD, I'm diabetic. So if I take CBD with my insulin, I need less insulin. Right. Um, it's kind of an interesting Which thing. Which is why it's important for you to talk to your doctor because you could be taking more CBD or more THC and lessening your other pharmaceuticals. And that in that case, they're going to have to know, like, oh, we need to back you off this. That makes me that brings up an interesting question I'm not even going to dive into, but then you start thinking about terpenes and strains and how terpenes affect different medications. And I could dive down that science rabbit hole like all day long and never stop. So it's just, it's one of those things that, but I know like for me that it's just been a huge reduction in the amount of medication that I have to take and the reduction in medication for me was a reduction in side effects because the side effects from my medications were the things that kicked my ass on a daily, daily basis. And I mean, I didn't hardly leave my house for a really long time because it was just, I was so sick. I had motion sickness, like I was on a boat or something all the time. And I grew up on the water, so I had never been motion sick a day in my life. And now I was motion sick sitting still. Um, you know, just go into the grocery store. And it was from one medication that was doing that. But then the cannabis totally, totally changed the way that I think it really actually kind of changed the body chemistry because endocannabinoid system. So I think that's something else. Have Dawn's popping her hand up. I'm wondering if any of y'all have had some experience having the explanation of the endocannabinoid system with a doctor, Dawn? Well, what I thought of is that you should tell when you went into the emergency room and it's a real emergency or if you're going in for a physical, like mm -hmm. before you have a surgery, mm -hmm. you must be hopeful about your cannabis because you're a cannabis user. Anesthesia does not work the same way and that could be fatal you don't want to wake up in surgery you don't want to um you don't want to aspirate during surgery because you come in too and i i don't know if i i've had surgical procedures where i knew they did stuff where i woke up and they were like how did you know that maybe i do i don't know but it was you have to be very very careful with that specifically that's interesting. I hadn't even thought about that. I, um, I've had surgery and I, I don't think I've had surgery since I've been using cannabis, but that's not even something I would have thought because a surgeon, like when you go have surgery, that's a completely different doctor than you normally mm -hmm. see. That's not your doctor that you go in and talk to about your medication and your cannabis and whatever you go see a surgeon. It's a completely different thing. And you have to have that whole conversation with them about that. I mean, with two people, you still have to talk to your anesthesiologist because that's the person giving you the drugs. That's the yeah. person that should know because when they need to be paying attention, if you start coming up. 
So I just started wondering about talking to psychiatrists about like, I know a lot, a lot, a lot of people who use cannabis for anxiety, myself included. I mean, it's a panic attack rescue thing for me. I carry a bottle of high milligram CBD and I have used that thing like a rescue inhaler when I had a public speaking engagement. Contrary to appearance, I pretend to be an extrovert for these things. So I mean, I, I, this is like a year or two ago and I had a speaking thing and I legit was having a panic attack and I did, did a big dose of CBD and it, it was a game changer. And at the time I was seeing a psychiatrist for anxiety medication and I told her I wanted to stop taking it because I was using CBD and she didn't believe me until I hadn't seen her for over a year. And she called me and said, you haven't been in. And I was like, I don't need you anymore. I've got cannabis. And she was like, oh, okay. Then, so I'm just wondering if any of you have had experience with patients that are using cannabis for anxiety or depression or any kind of, I mean, cannabis makes you feel good. That's one of the things we love about it, right? It's not completely outside the realm of possibility that people only use it because it makes them feel good. What's wrong with that? I mean, people go home from work and have a beer. Like that's, people use it to self-medicate. You know, uh, one of my friends, Wendy Turner, calls it, calls it over-the-counter use. You know, it's not necessarily replacing a prescription, but if I have a headache instead of taking a Tylenol, I might go smoke a bowl or I might eat a half a cookie or a gummy or whatever, you know? And so, I mean, that's one of the things, that's why it's so helpful, like for AIDS patients, that was how we kind of first started with legalization was in California and working with the AIDS patients and stuff. So I'll talk all day, but I really want to hear what you guys, if you guys have had some experience with dealing with psychiatrists specifically, Marcella, what about you? Have you had that? With psychiatrists, um, it hasn't really come up. Um, just apart from seeing the patients who are seeing psychiatrists and specifically like my doctor is writing um, on their certification, like does not want these medications, you know, does not want to be put on these medications, wants to stay away from these medications. Um, and the same as you're experiencing, I mean, they are feeling better. They're feeling happier. They can get through whatever it is they're, they're working on getting through um, using cannabis or CBD, whatever um, is, is best for them. They're doing it. And Marcella I mean, has a baby on her lap in case y'all didn't <laughs> know that. That's what's going on over there. She's got a, she's got a brand new little bundle of awesomeness sitting on her lap. So yeah. That's why Sorry. that's what's going on. That is okay. I think it's fantastic. I'm so glad that the little one was able to be with us tonight. I'm serious. I think that's great. So, April, what about you? Have you had any experience with patients that are using cannabis for psych psychiatric or I get, you call it psychiatric issues? Yeah. Anxiety. It's like common, oh my God, it was a crappy day kind yeah. of stuff, usually. Yeah, so before March, uh, I was talking to a lot of patients with, um, you know, anxiety, pain, insomnia. Um, but since March, I have noticed a huge uptick in not only anxiety, depression, and, you know, once you get in that cycle, you know, depression and anxiety can lead to pain. I mean, it's just, it's been a really difficult time for people. And yes, people are seeing a lot of success with cannabis. And like you said, you know, if it makes you feel good, what's so wrong with that? And I've had this conversation with people because I, I Apparently, according to the current research, um, uh, cannabis can be addictive for 9% of patients, or um, what do they call that condition? Uh, I don't know, some cannabis use disorder, right? Yes, yeah, I'm pretty sure I have that. Just so <laughs> I'm okay but, with it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, people talk about, oh, it's so addictive. I'm like, yeah, it's addictive because people want to feel good. What is wrong with wanting to feel good? I want to repeat that over and over again, but you know what? That is not going to kill me. That is not going to slow down my respiratory rate. That is not going to interact with a bunch of other medications. You know, it's not going to kill me. I want to feel good. So um, I've seen a lot of patients with psychiatric conditions. Absolutely. And I've seen a lot of patients having a lot of success with it. I think that I think that it's just one of those it's just that stigma of talking to talking to your doctors about it and I don't know I mean 
it'll be interesting to see where we are in like a year and we see how this has evolved. And I'm really interested. I know there are some doctors who are working in the Missouri space. Dr. Bo, Dr. Patricia Herford, um, some of the doctors that are working with the Mocan Trade Healthcare Committee on uh, CMA credits for doctors and educating them about the endocannabinoid system. But it's like, hey, your body has this whole system. And if we use this one thing, then it makes us feel better and it won't kill you and it won't make you sick. Um, and I don't know why that's such a stretch for so many, so many people. And I, we don't, we have had one comment from the audience. If there's anybody who has a question, now would be a fantastic time. And this is a good point. I think it's not realistic to say we can just fire a doctor who's prescribing pain medication. It's very hard to even find a doctor who would help with pain, let alone help move you from pain meds to cannabis. And you're, you're right on, Susan. That's absolutely true. And that's why I think we need to see if we can find some of those doctors and seek them out because that's going to be a really, that's a really, really important transition for patients to be able to make. If you have a medical cannabis card, now you have an option. But, you know, if you're on some of those heavy duty medications, you really do need a doctor to help you step off of it. Um, I didn't quit 46 pills a day cold turkey. It took me four months to come off of all that stuff. And I went to my doctor and I said, I'm doing this. I'm detoxing from this. I'm going to switch everything out for cannabis. And you can help me do it or you cannot help me do it, but I'm doing it. And she helped me, you know, and she wasn't happy about it, but I got off everything except for that one medication. And, you know, I'm 50. I don't have a realistic expectation that I'm going to end, you know, get to the end of my life and not be on any kind of prescriptions or whatever. But I try to be healthy, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't want to take all that stuff. So let's see. There's another comment. Um Oh, because some of the doctors are not uh, trained in the endocannabinoid system is because of the accreditation processes, and they've moved to an organ-based teaching instead of system-based, so I'm assuming that is referring to like the endocrine system um, and the nervous system, which is the system-based teaching versus organ, so that kind of makes sense. What were you going to say, Marcella? It was me. Oh, it may have been me. <laughs> uh, uh, what were you going to say, April? Uh, so, you know, working in healthcare for 15 years, um, you know, we're used to having these, uh, this clinical research that takes years to produce and requires these huge, these populations. And we're used to seeing that data and physicians are used to making recommendations and writing prescriptions on years and years of research, right? Unfortunately, we don't have the years and years and years of rigorous research that most doctors are used to looking at um, when it comes to a medication. So we're getting there. I think there's like 5,000 studies published a month on cannabis. Uh, so it's just going to take some time to be able to provide physicians with the information they're used to it's, looking at. It's one of the ironies to me that I hear so many times they say there's not enough studies but that's not actually true. Like you said, 5,000 studies. Um, Pub, PubMed.gov has got all these studies, but the problem is they're not FDA approved studies. And that's where it gets tricky because there, there are some loopholes because it's a schedule one controlled substance that they can't actually do FDA studies um, except under very specific parameters. They recently changed those parameters up until uh, a few months ago, they had to use cannabis from the University of Mississippi, which was known to have spider mite issues and other kinds of creepy crawly things mm -hmm. going on. And Dr. Sue Sicily is one of the people who really um, worked with different organizations like NCIA and some of the national groups that are lobbying to change some of that. So it's amazing to me how many women are moving this industry forward for patients, for research, for science. Science is on our side. I mean, that's why we're all still here, right? It's because the science is on our side and we have these superheroes that are doing all this really hard work. A lot of those studies come out of Israel, you know, and so, um, the United States is definitely not in the, the forefront of cannabis research, but I'm glad somebody's doing it. 
Do you ladies think I missed anything in this conversation? Do you have anything you want to add to that? We didn't get a whole lot of questions from the audience tonight, but I feel like we covered a whole lot. There's a couple that we need to get to. Do what? They came in. We do have a couple that came in um, that I see a couple questions. One was, I think it's not realistic to say we can just fire a doctor who's prescribing pain medication it is very hard to find a doctor uh, who would even help with pain, let alone help you move from pain meds to cannabis. Um, yep. I understand that question. And what I say to patients is, yes, this is going to be research, as I think Marcella already said. You're going to have to actually check out every provider that is available in your region, near and far, because it's going to be a hard search. Those physicians, even if morally, they are swayed in favor for us. Um, they may not be able to outwardly speak to that. So that's kind of the difficulty in, you know, pulling those names because it's top three. It's, it, it's who, you know, who you can say, oh, that person goes there and I know they smoke. Are they honest with their doctor? So it is a bit of trial and error and you know, it's not fun, but you have every opportunity to hire and fire providers as you see fit. To walk into a physician's office and to be disrespected is unacceptable, period. I agree. And, and you can't have my other. patients recently bring that me. Um, just in care before even bringing cannabis up, but just being completely tearing them down because they're wrong and already in a fragile state. Some providers, as they are human, um, don't take into account their bias at that moment when they tear someone down after like patient 18. You know, they see in 20, 25 patients in a day, which those conglomerate doctors are up to that, which is they're stressed out, which is where an advocate kind of tries to piece that together for you. Give the doctor some grace too. I they have their human. Um, but it is an opportunity to still hire and fire ever to take care of you. I think that's a really good point. Doctors are human. And I think, you know, they are doing the best they can with the information they have and the circumstances. And you know, I'm glad that re-education efforts are, are underway and there's going to be some CMA credits for doctors on cannabis and all that. So I'm excited. I'm excited about what the future looks like in Missouri. And I feel like we're off to a good start. And I'm so, so grateful for the three of you being here with me tonight and having this conversation. Um, I it's again I mean you can tell because I've been talking all night but it's I'm really passionate about this and I really really hope that this um this has been informational and has been able to help some patients and I just want to invite you all to be with us next week next Thursday night we are going to have an industry forum and we are going to talk about the environmental impact of the cannabis industry this is not a topic a whole lot of people want to talk about um this is, a, this is a topic that's a problem that doesn't have a whole lot of solutions, but we are gonna talk about the solutions. I have a guy who's got some hemp packaging solutions that could be really amazing. And I've got Kristen Denham from Erase the Trace. And I've got Bethany White, who's a marketing person from Clover. And she's gonna help us understand how some of the packaging and labeling requirements that DHSS requires how that's gonna actually affect the environmental footprint. You don't think about things like that, but if you start to consider that there are font size requirements on a vape cart box, how big does a vape cart box have to be to hold all that print, even if it only needs to be that big to hold the vape cart? So, I mean, I think if you've ever been into a legal dispensary, you will know that there's always really excessive packaging and all that. So we're gonna have that conversation. I want to, once again, say thank you so much to our sponsors and to our guests. And I just thank you so much for getting your news and your information about the cannabis community from us here at Midwest Canna Expos. And I will see you all next week. Have a great night. Thanks so much for joining us here at the Cannabis Forum. If you'd like information about this broadcast or others in the series, you can find that on our website, MidwestCannaExpos.com. Be sure you hit the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when you get new content from Midwest Canna Expo's YouTube channel. And be sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get updates on our virtual and our in-person events. Thanks for joining us and we hope to see you again at the forum.